In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for reminding us that you are a God that will never change. And that whatever you have done before, you'll do it again. We have come here so you can strengthen the weak, so you can lift up those who are falling, and so that you'll be able to strengthen those who are faint-hearted. We are asking, O oh Lord, in these days we are going to be spending together, you will strengthen everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, during this period, you'll touch everyone. You remove the feebleness in our minds, in our hearts, in Jesus' name. Every time, as we listen to the songs, as we listen to the messages, as we listen to the studies, we are praying, O oh Lord, as we are opened unto you, you will touch every one of us. You will transform our lives. And you will get us ready for the work ahead of us in Jesus' name. We pray, o Lord, as we study together this morning, what we've done before, do it again. Revive all souls again. Encourage everyone again instruct every one of us again that we may be able to rise up in the strength of the Lord and go ahead to do what you have called us to do thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray as you know that um, during our congresses we always have a special series of Bible teaching and it's very central in our Congress the book we have chosen this time is uh, the epistle of Paul to Timothy the second epistle and as soon already as Bible students and preachers yourself we have four chapters and we're going to take a chapter each day and uh, we're going to start with chapter 1 today which is challenge for a fainting minister challenge for a fainting minister and then chapter 2 which by the grace of God will deal with tomorrow the marks of an effective minister chapter 3 will be the ministry of, of the inspired scriptures in perilous times and then we'll be ending the studies with solemn charge for latter day preachers in chapter 4. Today we are starting with chapter 1. But before I go into chapter 1, it is necessary that we'll make some introduction for the book itself. As we look at the book and take a little survey, we'll need to know about the writer. We'll need to know about the recipient that is the one that received the letter, the epistle. And then, of course, you'll finally see the application to ministers of the gospel today. There are three epistles among the epistles of Paul the Apostle. We call them pastoral epistles. You may know that uh, Paul the Apostle was instrumental to giving us the majority of the epistles in the New Testament were indebted to him for the great knowledge of the kingdom, the mystery of the kingdom that he has preserved by inspiration to the church today. There are three of those letters, three of those epistles that he wrote, and they are called pastoral epistles. The three are First Timothy, Second Timothy, and titles why do we refer to them as the pastoral epistles look at uh, first uh, first timothy chapter 3 and in verse 15 but if i tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of god which is the church of the living god the pillar and the ground of truth he wrote these three epistles that the pastors, the ministers of the world 
in the churches will be able to know one how to conduct themselves two how to lead in the church three how to appoint the ministers and the servants of the lord four how to maintain sound doctrine in the church five how to fulfill the ministry into which we are called and because of the instructions we have in those epistles then the uh, those epistles are referred to as epistles helping pastors and preachers to do the work of the lord in the church you come to second epistle of paul now the apostle to timothy you see that right in the title the second epistle the word epistle simply means a letter written sent by god inspired by god by the spirit of god but with uh, an instrument a pen man a person through which the word came the human channel and that is paul but not just ordinary paul paul the apostle called to be an apostle and he did the work of an apostle and he wrote this to timothy first of all but you remember how jesus closed every letter every epistle he sent to the churches he would say to the angel of the church in ephesus right or he will say to the angel of the church in smyrna right or he will say to the angel of the church in Tyra, right but at the end of every letter then he will say everyone he that has ears to hear let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches then you learn from that by extension although it was primarily written to timothy by extension it is written to you and to me he that has an ear to hear let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches now it starts with paul an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god do you see something here in the olden days whenever they wrote a letter you put the name of the writer right in front so you don't have to be wondering who wrote the letter things have changed you know that whenever we write our letters today how do we write the letter we'll say dear so and so we put the name of the recipient up front at the beginning of the letter and then at the very end of the letter in the bottom we we'll, we'll say sincerely yours so and so so we put our name last but in the olden days it wasn't like that the writer will put his name first and so you have paul who is paul paul was that antagonist of the gospel who became converted on the road to damascus and the after he became converted he started preaching the word of the lord because from the very beginning god chose him to be an apostle to be a teacher a chosen vessel in the hand of the lord but you see from the very beginning he suffered for the preaching of the gospel in fact we're told and you can read that there is internal evidence in the epistles that he wrote he was in prison for the preaching of the gospel a number of times in many places he was imprisoned he was imprisoned in jerusalem he was imprisoned in caesarea he was imprisoned in philippi and at the time he was imprisoned in rome no time to read all the scriptures please write it down in acts chapter 28 from verses 30 and 31 that was like a house arrest because he had a measure of freedom he could receive visitors and still preach and teach the word in fact it was at that time of imprisonment that he wrote the epistles to the ephesians he wrote to the philippians he wrote to the colossians and he wrote also to philemon by the time of this uh, second epistle to timothy he was in chase again see that in uh, first second timothy chapter one verse 16 by the time he was writing the second epistle to timothy imprisoned again about five or six years later chapter one verse 16 the lord give mercy 
unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. That means he was chained. He was imprisoned even at this time. Look at chapter 2 and verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds. He was in chains at that time. He was imprisoned at that time. Chapter 4 verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. You learn a lesson from here. You learn the lesson that Paul the Apostle had persecution as a constant companion. He had trouble, trial, tribulation, conflict, imprisonment as constant companions. Yet the word of God kept on being preached. He didn't use his imprisonment as an excuse. I have too much trouble, I cannot preach. I have too much difficulty, I cannot evangelize. I'm imprisoned every time. I've suffered too much. I cannot go on. He knew he could go on. In fact, he says it in a beautiful way in chapter 2, verse 9. Look at it again. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bounds, but... The word of God is not bound. I'm bound. I'm chained. I'm imprisoned. I'm restricted. The troubles are there. But the word of God keeps going on. I pray it will be like that in our lives as well in Jesus' name. Now, he wrote to Timothy. Who was Timothy? Timothy was a young uh, fellow. And uh, he was uh, very young in comparison with Paul the Apostle. Now when we say young, many times when you read the scriptures that says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in truth, in faith, in charity, in purity. Oh, we think that man was very young and some people think he must have been a teenager. No, not at all. You see, at this very time, Paul was about between 60 and 66 years of age. And Timothy was about 36 years of age. And you see the difference and the gap between them. About 30 years in between them. And so Paul could write and say, Paul the aged at 66. And writing to Timothy 30 years younger, obviously, is going to look at him as a young fellow. And therefore, he called him youth, not teenager. He was between 30 and 36. But something about Timothy. Timothy had been converted before Paul, the apostle, met him. And uh, Timothy had been recommended by other people, believers that knew him. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. Reading from verse 1. Then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. That's the man, Timothy. The son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him. Him would Paul have to go forth with him. By the time that Paul the apostle met Timothy, he was already born again. He was already converted. He was already in fellowship with other believers. In fact, those other believers recommended him to Paul the apostle. And then he became a companion. But something significant about Timothy, whenever Paul the Apostle referred to him, he always referred to him as Timothy, my beloved son. Timothy, my own son in the faith. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 17. For this cause I have sent unto you, Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. Can you make yourself dear like that to your pastor?
Can you make yourself dear like that to your leader? That every time he refers to you, he will remember you with joy. He will remember you with a kind of satisfaction. He will remember you as a person faithful in the Lord. And he cannot finish mentioning your name without saying, My beloved son, faithful in the Lord. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. You see that? He could hardly finish mentioning his name, and then immediately will add, My own son in the faith. Second Timothy chapter 1, and reading verse 2. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That was the place that uh, Timothy had in the heart of his father in the Lord. Although he had been born again before Timothy met him, or before Paul the apostle met him, yet the relationship that went on between them was a relationship between his spiritual father and his son in the faith. And if you read the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find that if you read from uh, chapter 16, from where they met until the end of the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find that Timothy accompanied Paul the Apostle in his uh, first, mission, first mission to Europe. And they evangelized together the towns of Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. He also remained for some time in Berea with Silas. But he was soon to join Paul the Apostle in Athens, where he was sent again to Thessalonica to establish the church there. That's in 1 Thess uh, Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Then Timothy returned to Thessalonica, or to, uh, to the Apostle at uh, Corinth, where the two epistles to the Thessalonians were written. Later, during the long stay of Paul in Ephesus, Timothy being with him, he was sent again to Macedonia towards the end of Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. And now he had, uh, they have been separated for some time, and Paul the Apostle now is uh, desiring to see Timothy. At this time, what was Timothy doing? Timothy was a pastor in the church at Ephesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Sorry, it's 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 3. I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. At that time, Timothy was the pastor in, um, in Ephesus, and he was in charge of the whole work there, and now Paul, the apostle, needed to write to him to encourage him. But we know something about Timothy. Although Timothy was sound in doctrine, and there was no doubt about his Christian life, yet he had tendency to be faint-hearted. Timothy was sound in doctrine. There was no problem about his spiritual life, his Christian life, yet he had tendency to being faint-hearted. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He was telling him, Timothy, Oh yes, you are going to meet with opposers of the gospel. You are going to meet with the people that are given to vain, uh, vain babblings and profane kind of uh, philosophies. But don't you be afraid because God has not given us the spirit of fear. He has given us the spirit of power. He has given us the spirit of love. He has given us the spirit of a sound mind. As we look at uh, chapter 1 today, we're going to divide uh, chapter 1 into three parts. Part 1, motivation for an effective ministry. That you'll find in verses 1 to 5. Part 2, ministering without shame in the Lord's service. That you'll find in verses 6 to 12. 
And part three, maintaining sound doctrine without compromise. That you'll find in verses 13 to 18. Every point here is speaking directly to you and speaking directly to me. We need to be motivated for an effective ministry. We need to minister without shame in the service of the Lord. And we need to maintain sound doctrine without compromise in the face of danger, in the face of trouble. Let's go back to point number one. Motivation for an effective ministry. Look at your Bible as I read. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 reading from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus to Timothy my dearly beloved son grace mercy peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see thee be mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Here we find uh, the first thing, and there are four things I want to underline in the five verses I've read to you. And you need to note them down, write them down. They're very important for a teacher, teaching students. They're very important for a pastor, pastoring a church. They're very important for a leader directing the affairs of the church. Here are the four words in uh, this uh, passage that I see. Number one, authority. Authority, the authority of an apostle, the authority of a representative of the Lord, the authority of an ambassador. Number one, authority. Number two, affection. Affection. Number three, appreciation. Number four, affirmation. Let's look at them one by one. You see, Paul was very, very familiar with Timothy. In fact, they were so familiar that in some of the epistles, Paul will write and say, Paul and Timotheus. Then he will say, unto the church he was writing to. A few times, or one or two times, he'll join the name of uh, Silvanus. He'll say, Paul, Timotheus, and Silvanus. Very, very familiar. But you realize that the familiarity between Paul and Timothy did not degenerate into content. There must be a balance. You are intimate with your congregation. You are familiar with your congregation. You love your congregation. There is a measure of intimacy between the teacher and the student. And yet, that intimacy must not destroy the authority of the one that has sent you. The preacher always ought to maintain the authority, not the authority that you have yourself, but the authority that comes as a result of the weighty message the Lord has given to you. Paul himself was a man under divine authority. And because of that, any time he spoke, whether I was speaking to a familiar Timothy, I was speaking to a friendly Titus, I was speaking to a companion like Luke, or speaking to another person, he always manifested the authority of a teacher. Say this way, intimacy does not preclude authority. Intimacy does not preclude authority. That means this, that intimacy and authority must go together in a balanced way. Intimacy and authority must go together in a balanced way. Sometimes you'll find that uh, a person who is a preacher is such a loving fellow, is such an amiable person, is such a good character, uh, that everybody likes him, everybody gets around him, but then he doesn't balance it up. The way he talks, the way he relates, the way he moves, the way he interacts, and the kinds of joke you find in his mouth, 
that the people they see themselves as on the same level with their pastor there is no authority at all and when he is talking everybody is at his so they say is a son so talking I'll talk that point over with him when he finishes how can he be that serious I see him uh, getting serious and quoting the Bible I see if it's not a uh, brother so and so and then after he finishes the message they'll put uh, they'll put his clothes and say ah, how could you say what you said the other time I knew you you were not serious were you and then he'll say forget about it you know that's preaching when you are preaching you have to be dead serious but now it's, you know, just talking together. Intimacy has destroyed authority. But in the life of the preacher, both must go together. Now, you'll you find that when you are talking to somebody you know very well, you don't introduce yourself as apostle. But uh, Paul, the apostle, needed to do that. He was writing to somebody who already knew that he was an apostle. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Timothy, I'm writing to you. And I'm going to be giving you some imperatives. I'm going to be giving you some commandments. But I'm not doing it as a friend. You are my beloved son. We are very, very familiar. But I'm not doing this on the basis of familiarity. I am giving you these compelling truths because I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ by the will of God. He tells us two things about his apostleship. Number one, the origin of his apostleship. Number two, the purpose of his apostleship. It says, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ by the will of God. That's the origin, the very foundation, the very basis of the apostleship of Paul the Apostle. And then he tells us the purpose, the reason why he was an apostle. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. The purpose is to proclaim the gospel of the Lord, which is able to give life, the kind of life that we find in Christ, the kind of life which is victorious over the world, victorious over sin, and victorious over death. I told you there are four words we find in this uh, brief uh, passage in the introduction. The first one is authority, which we have spoken about. The second one is affection. You must balance everything up. You know, there are preachers that are very, very authoritative. When they talk, the tone is authoritative. The language is authoritative. The air, the atmosphere is authoritative. The sentences are authoritative. Everything that is said is authoritative. The only problem is it's authority without affection that destroys the church too. Authority is good. But then you balance that authority with affection. See how Paul the Apostle did it. Now in verse 2, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. That's affection. He said, well, I'm writing, I'm an apostle, I'm called by God, I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is to proclaim life eternal, which we find in Christ Jesus, but don't be scared by that authority, I love you, I have affection for you. I'm thinking about you, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace. Before I comment on those three things, I want to remind you, I said this last year when we were studying the epistle of a Jude, that if you look at the epistle of Jude, you'll see three things always being connected together. You'll see mentioning this, this, and this. Another time he gets to another verse, and he mentions this, this, and this. It's always, almost always the same one, two, three. And then he says some other things. He says one, two, three. And uh, Paul, the apostle, is doing that here. Can you see the three things here? Number one, grace. Number two, mercy. Number three, peace. And uh, he mentions uh, three other things. Again, look at verse 11. Whereunto I am appointed, number one, a preacher. Number two, an apostle. Number three, a teacher of the Gentiles. Uh, whenever you read the scriptures, look at the pattern in scripture. You will see that the scripture is not just written haphazardly. You just throw things everywhere. Just say things and say them anyhow. God is a God of organization. 
And the spirit of God is a, a spirit of organization. Everything is organized in a very systematic way, so there is no confusion. And now he tells us in verse 2 to Timothy, My dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Here we find the manifestation of authority coming with affection. He referred to him as my dearly beloved son. And then he was asking for grace, asking for mercy, and asking for peace from God to be given unto him. Why grace? Grace sufficient for the task of ministry. Paul the apostle himself knew the value of grace. Saved by grace. Appointed by grace. Doing everything he did by grace. Finding the grace of God to be sufficient for him. Even in all his trials and tribulations, my grace is sufficient for you. He knew the value of grace and he wanted Timothy to know the value of grace. Grace unto you. The grace, the abundant grace of the Lord, sufficient for the ministry. Then he pleaded for divine mercy. To protect him from the misery of his failures in ministry. And then peace of mind, peace of heart to dominate his life while facing all the conflicts in ministry. We see genuine affection here. Wishing Timothy full spiritual blessing. Uh, and uh, that must have encouraged uh, Timothy a lot. Let's move on to the third point uh, in this uh, point one. And it is uh, appreciation. Authority, that's number one. Affection, that's number two. And now appreciation. That's number three. Look at verses three and four. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure, with pure conscience with uh, that without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. Now, look at this. I thank God. Let's omit that for the moment. And let's look at what follows. Whom I serve from my forefathers. What could that mean? Did that mean he had been serving God before he was even born at the time of his forefathers? Obviously no. What he's saying is, I am in the line of my forefathers who were serving God. But who are those forefathers? Did he mean his literal father? No. Because if you know anything about the Jewish people, all the Jewish people related their lives back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And every one of them, whatever their tribe, claimed affiliation, association with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Do you, do you need a little to remember their history? Jacob was changed to Israel. Israel had 12 sons. The names of those 12 sons became the names of the tribes, the tribes of Israel. And therefore, any Israelite will belong to one tribe or the other. And that tribe will be linked back to Jacob. Jacob linked back to Isaac, and Isaac linked back to Abraham. And so when Paul the Apostle said, Whom I serve from my forefathers, is thinking about Abraham. He served the Lord. Walk before me and be thou perfect. He's thinking of Isaac. He's thinking of Jacob. And he's thinking of people like Moses. He's thinking of people like Joshua. He's thinking of the good, good people that had lived in generations past in the land of Israel. And they served the Lord. He said, they are my forefathers. They received the oracle of the Lord. They passed it on to us. And I'm in that same thing right now. And I'm serving the Lord that my forefathers spiritually that they had served. Then he says something. He said, with pure conscience. That's very important. Remember, please. At this time, Paul the apostle was in the prison. He was languishing in jail. And they took him to be a criminal. 
They took him to be a fellow that was sinful, a fellow that was uh, doing wrong. In fact, there were some people that named the name of Christ who said, yes, Paul is suffering for his evil doing. It's okay for him to suffer. And yet he said, I'm in the prison here. I'm under chains. I am bound, but I have pure conscience. I'm near death. I'm about to finish my course. And I'm about to pour out my life as an offering unto the Lord. And yet there is no guilt in my heart. What a wonderful thing if you could say that in the time of persecution. That you are not suffering for your foolishness. You are not suffering for iniquity. You are not suffering for evil doing. That in the time of persecution, even if it gets to imprisonment, you are still having a pure conscience towards God. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, reading from verse um, 16. Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men pure conscience toward God and toward men. Please come back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Now it says, I thank God. What's he thanking God for? He's thanking God for Timothy, omit uh, whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience, but now read it this way, I thank God that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day now something is remarkable here here is the ministry of a pastor here is the life of a pastor you realize that paul the apostle was suffering in the prison he should have been praying for himself he should have been saying god look at my condition he should have been complaining all the people in asia minor they have abandoned me they have forsaken me at the first time when i appeared before the tribunal nobody appeared with me everybody forsook me it was only on the for us that uh, sought me out may god bless him and alexander the copper smith was a uh, very very opposed to what i was saying everybody has abandoned me look at my condition and get into self-pity not paul the apostle that man was a real servant of God. I pray you all be like that. Instead of thinking about himself in the prison, he was thinking about Timothy. He said, Timothy, I'm praying for you. How did he pray for him? I want you to notice how he said it. He said, without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers. And then he said, night and day. Paul, you're repeating yourself. If you say, I pray for you night and day, that's enough. If you say, I pray for you without ceasing, that's enough. How is it to say, I pray for you night and day without ceasing? It says, I want Timothy to get this fact. Every waking moment, I'm praying for him. I pray for him without ceasing. I pray for him night and day. And so you see the life of a minister praying, remembering the people that are in trouble. Instead of remembering himself. If we are to analyze our lives... And a nice uh, prayer request, we may find we pray for ourselves most of the time. You are pastors, you are women leaders, you pray for yourselves most of the time. But Paul the Apostle didn't even have a single prayer request, even though he was in the prison. And then he said, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears. Paul, don't you have your own tears? Don't you have your own trouble? Don't you have your own kind of suffering in the prison? Yes, I do, but I have offered myself. I have forgotten myself. I'm only to live to remember other people. And so I don't remember my trouble, greatly desiring to see thee because I'm mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. Paul, what will make you happy? If the Roman government should just declare you now to be a free man, will that make you happy? He say, well, maybe, I don't know. But what will really give you joy? It says, when I see young Timothy rising up, bearing the cross, preaching the word, 
being strong in the Lord, marching on, moving forward, doing everything that is called upon to do, even if I still remain in the prison, that doesn't bother me at all. The thing that gives me joy, the thing that keeps me moving on, the thing that motivates me internally is to find that the people I've given the gospel to, they have taken it, they have accepted it, they believe it, they are moving on with it. That should be the joy of every minister as well. Now he gives us the fourth point, which is affirmation. Look at verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded it is in thee also. That's affirmation. He affirmed his life. He affirmed his faith. He affirmed his service unto the Lord. And that's what we ought to be doing. You are a leader leading other people. You are a pastor feeding the flock. Let there be authority. But let there be affection. Let there be appreciation. Let there be affirmation. It is those things coming from Paul the Apostle by the Spirit of God that helped Timothy and challenged him to keep his hands on the work and to keep his heart on the Lord and to keep his mind on his call and to keep his eyes on the goal. That's what those four things will do for us. If we have authority in the ministry, we have affection from the minister, we have appreciation coming through the leader, and we have affirmation. He appreciates our service, he appreciates our lives, he appreciates our ministry. They will help us, number one, to keep our hands on the work of the Lord. Number two, to keep our hearts always on the Lord. Number three, to keep our minds on the calling he has given us. Number four, to keep our eyes on the goal. I go to point number two. Ministering without shame in the Lord's service. We're reading now from verse 6 all through to verse 12. From verse 6, wherefore... I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which uh, was given us in Jesus Christ before the world began. But is now manifest, made manifest by the appearing of our Savior and Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, for which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Here we find ministering without shame in the Lord's service. Do you realize how Paul the Apostle mentioned not having shame? In this epistle, look at chapter 1 verse 8. Be thou therefore not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, minister without shame. Look at verse 12. For which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. Look at verse 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he ought refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Look at chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And so you find that Paul the Apostle was calling upon Timothy that he will minister the word of God. He will minister in the service of the Lord without shame. Without shame. And that's a challenge for you and for me today. That we ought to be bold and courageous in the service of the Lord, whatever the cost might be. 
You see, no matter how gifted a person may be, no matter his opportunities or the privileges he may have, if he lacks spiritual courage, if he lacks spiritual commitment, he will not be effective in the sight in the uh, service of the Lord. That's the reason why we need to be bold, unashamed, uncompromising, totally committed to the service of the Lord. Now, because of the demands of ministry, the difficulties and the problems encountered, Timothy's fervor and devotion had begun to cool off to some degree. That's why Paul the Apostle was challenging him. And he was telling him, look at verse 6, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Thou stir up the gift of God. The question is, what gift was Timothy to stir up? A good question for you and for me. You see, there are many of us that we know how to stir up the gifts of other people. We, we challenge uh, coordinators, we challenge zonal leaders, we challenge location pastors, we challenge uh, other people. I see the gift of God in your life. I see that you are cooling up. Then we challenge them, stir it up. And make sure that the flame, the fire of God is burning in your soul. The problem is, although we may know how to stir up another person or the gift in them, the question is, do I know how to stir up the gift of God in me? Do you know how to stir up the gift of God in you? Because Timothy was told, he said, stir up the gift of God. Not the gift of God which is in Titus. Not the gift of God, which is in Paul the Apostle. Not the gift of God, which is in Luke the Physician. Stir up the gift of God, which is in you. How do you stir up the gift of God in you? Number one, recognize the gift. If you don't even know what you have, how are you going to stir it up? Recognize the gift. Number two, dedicate that gift to God's glory. This gift God has given to me, it is for ministry. And I'm dedicating it fully to the glory of God. Number three, forget self. Those athletes that run, if they are running and they're looking at their feet, they're not going to run well. If they are looking at the movement of their hands while they're running, they're not going to run well. If they are running and they're looking at themselves, they're not going to run well. Forget yourself in the exercise of your gift number four exercise the gift you've seen some very very intelligent people who are not educated when you discuss with them you realize they are very very intelligent there's nothing wrong with their brain but they are not educated why they never exercise that brain they never read they don't go to school Although the intelligence is there, the brain is there, but that brain is not going to work because it is not put to use. If the gift is there, exercise it. Number five, keep the purpose in mind for which the gift was given. And make sure that at every opportunity that you see that the gift can be used, you say, this is my chance. This is the opportunity. It must be done now. This is a purpose for which the gift was given. Number six, exalt the giver. Don't exalt the gift, exalt the giver. When you do that, it's going to give you more. It's going to increase it. It's going to sharpen the edge of that gift in your life. Number seven, be always ready for more service. You finish what you are doing now, you say, can I have more? Can I do more? I'm still available. That's how to exercise the gift of God which is in you, which was given to you by the putting on of my hands. But don't let that uh, disturb you. There are many people that are saying, I just wish uh, one day the pastor will lay hands on me and then I can have the gifts. Well, that's just one way. But Moses had the gifts in his life without anybody laying hands on him. Do you realize that? 
And Daniel had the gifts of God in his life without anybody laying hands on him. Do you realize that? And Isaiah and Jeremiah, they are the gifts of God in their lives without anybody laying hands on them. In fact, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, there wasn't any laying of hands. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And sending out the seventy-two by two, he gave unto them power and authority over disease and demons. There was not any laying on of hands at all, but you see, there are people that have hands laid on them. Them. There are others that do not have hands laid on them yet. If you have the Lord and you have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God comes to your life with gifts of the Spirit. I believe it's there already. I said I believe it's there already. You will stir it up and it will be used to the glory of the Lord in Jesus' name. But you know, Timothy had a tendency to be afraid. In verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear paralyzes. But divine power makes us dynamic in God's service. The spirit of fear is not from God. We have from God the spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. Have you seen the uh, three things I'm talking about? You know, they always go in three in uh, some of these passages. And it says, he has given us the spirit of number one, of power. Number two, of love. Number three, of a sound mind. And uh, these are the things we have received from the Lord. We have the spirit of power. That is power for effective service. We also have the spirit of love. That is to have the love for God. Unfeigned love. The perfect love that casts out fear. The love of Christ that passes knowledge. That's the love that makes us desire and to work for the best interests of the kingdom of God and for the best interests of the people of God. And then it says, of a sound mind. That is, a disciplined mind that will put every area, every detail of the life in a proper perspective and will order your priorities. Then he tells us in verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed. That little word talking there, therefore, is referring back to verses 6 and 7. He said, because I've told you, the gift is there. Because I'm telling you, stop that gift. Because I'm telling you, we have not received the spirit of fear. Because I've told you already, we have the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind, Therefore, because of those things I've said, there is no need to be ashamed. When you think of how great your God is, when you think of the gift he has put within you, there will be nothing to make you ashamed. And now he tells us uh, verses uh, 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10 is a kind of a short uh, exposition on our salvation. For those who are theological students, uh, that's, um, uh, that's uh, something on the soteriology. That is, on the salvation that we have uh, from the Lord. See how he beautifully puts everything. The latter part of verse 8, it says, The gospel, according to the power of God, now in verse 9, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel very quickly I want you to notice five things there number one God has saved us from the power and the penalty of sin he mentions the gospel then he mentions that God that has saved us. Verse 9. He has saved us. He saves us from the power of sin and from the penalty of sin. Number 2. He has called us with an holy calling. He has called us. He called us by his spirit. He called us by the preaching of the word. And then we responded in faith, and now we have entered into the kingdom. He has called us with an holy calling. Number three, we are saved not by our own merits, but by his grace, according to his purpose. We are saved 
not by works that we have done. We turn away from sin. We turn to the Savior. We receive him as our Savior. The great sacrifice, our substitute. And then we are saved. Number four, Jesus Christ is presented in those two verses as Savior and Lord who abolished death. That is, he rendered death inoperative. Number five, he has brought life and immortality through the gospel. He has brought life, life eternal and immortality through the gospel. And now in verse 11, wherefore I am appointed a preacher. And many people that have run and the Lord has not sent them. You can see the Lord has not sent them because they are not bearing the fruit. You can see they are not committed to it. You can see they do not have any vision. You can see that they do not have any conviction within that God sent me to do this thing that I'm doing and I can succeed and I will succeed in the name of the Lord. But Paul the Apostle said, I am appointed. Paul, why are you running so fast and everybody feels that you are doing too much? I'm appointed to do it. Paul, why is it you've gone on the first missionary journey and you've come back, you're not resting, you're going back again, I'm appointed to do it. Paul, why is it they stoned you almost to death in that place and you want to go back there again and preach, that's what I'm appointed for. Paul the apostle, why is it you have been imprisoned a lot of times and yet even in the prison you are still preaching the gospel and some of the people that are changed to you, they are born again already, I'm appointed to it. Paul the apostle, why is it you are always doing it, always doing it, always doing it and even though you are now at your old age, you are still not stopping, I am appointed to it. He knew that he was an appointed man. Are you an appointed man? Has God appointed you? And do you know he has appointed you to do something? Then stay at your post and do it. Stay where you are and do it. He said, I am appointed. Appointed to be a preacher. Appointed to be an apostle. Appointed to be a teacher of the Gentiles. Three things again that he mentions. Number one, a preacher. That's a function in his ministry. He says, that's what I do. I preach the word of God. I preach the whole counsel of God. I preach the salvation of the Lord. I preach, I proclaim, I publicize the grace of our Savior who died for us on the cross of Calvary. That's what I'm appointed to do. I'm appointed a preacher. Number two, an apostle. That's the authority that emphasizes the authority that God gave him when he was appointed. And now he says, a teacher. That's explaining, emphasizing his interpretation of the message that he proclaimed in an authoritative manner. Then comes the beautiful verse, verse 12. It says, for which cause I suffer these things. I suffer because of the appointment. I suffer because of the ministry. I suffer because of what the Lord has told me to do, and I'm doing it. He said, for this cause, I also suffered these things. Then he said, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Am I ashamed being a prisoner? No, I'm not ashamed. Am I ashamed that everybody is misunderstanding St. Paul is suffering for all that he did before he was born again? He persecuted the church. Look at what comes on him now. He said, I'm not ashamed. Am I ashamed that I was a member of the Sanhedrin before and I was a trained under Gamaliel and the other people are telling me, see what you have made yourself to become. You could have been on the ivory tower of the Jewish religion now. See where you are now. He said, I'm not ashamed. You think about your life and then your friends will be telling you where you could have been. Your friends will be telling you what you could have been doing. Your friends will be telling you, why it not for this madness in religion? Why it not for this consecration? Why it not for uh, this foolishness of abandoning uh, your very life into this thing that you call a preaching, 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 evangelizing? Why it not for that now? You know, we know where you would have been. But it says, I am not ashamed. Are you ashamed? I said, are you ashamed? It's the other people that are going to be ashamed in eternity. We are not ashamed. When we get over there, you will know who we are. Because it is not yet revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then look at what he says. He says, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. And then he says, I am persuaded. 
I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day. Against that day. Now the question is, what day was Paul the apostle referring to when he said he's going to keep what I'm committing to him against that day? Look at chapter 1 verse 18. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. That's the day of recompense. That's the day of reward. That's the day when God will look at all our works and he will say, well done. Look at chapter 4 verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day day is referring to the day when rewards will be given out the day when god will examine all that you have done on earth and then he will praise you for what has been done and reward you for what has been done for i know whom i have believed chapter 1 verse 12 for i am persuaded that he is able to keep that which i have committed unto him against that day now we come to point number three to conclude everything maintaining sound doctrine without compromise maintaining sound doctrine without compromise verses 13 and 14 hold fast the form of sound word don't hold the word of god with a loose hand don't regard the word of god with carelessness don't hold the word of god and hold another thing you know, if you are carrying too many things, have you, have you realized uh, when uh, our young people are told to carry, maybe they are supposed to carry their books, and then they carry this and carry this, they want to carry everything at the same time. As they are going, many things will be dropping on the way. And the same thing with us who are adults. You try to carry too many things at the same time, and you find that they will be dropping on the way. If you try to carry the doctrine of the Bible and politics at the same time, you try to carry the doctrine of the Bible and uh, the social affairs of life at the same time. You try to carry the doctrine of the Bible and uh, your family desires and your extended family aspirations at the same time. The doctrine is going to be dropping up. But hold this thing with a firm hand and say, if there is no other thing in my life, it, if it is this word of eternal life, I believe it is enough. I said I believe it is enough. And so hold it fast, hold it tight, hold on to it and keep on to it. These are dangerous times when many people are letting it go. And they are holding the word of God with a loose hand. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing sound doctrine that good thing the doctrines of the bible that good thing the whole counsel of the word of god which was committed unto thee keep by the holy ghost which dwelleth in us you see the challenge has always been in fact this has always been the challenge that paul the apostle gave unto timothy he said timothy you forget any other thing remember this one keep that which has been committed into your hand. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy thrust. Keep that which is committed to thy thrust. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Keep that which is committed to your trust. Look at uh, Titus. Chapter 1, verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But speak the things which become sound doctrine. Speak the things which befit, which become sound doctrine. Sound doctrine, the divinely inspired word, divinely revealed word, the absolute word of God, unique word of God, perfect word of God, sufficient word of God, was the thing that Timothy was to hold on to. It's of great importance. In it is found everything necessary for salvation and life and godliness. Sound doctrine leads to holy living. Sound doctrine leads to holy living the absence of it will lead to unholy living there is no way 
you can encourage holiness among those who listen to you if you are not holding on to sound doctrine effective christian ministry as well as courageous christian living it's not possible apart from strong biblical convictions now let's look at the way paul ends chapter one we're reading from verse 15 now this thou knowest that all they which are in asia be turned away from me of whom are by jealous and emogen emogenes uh, the lord have mercy on the house of onesiphorus and uh, for he ought refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain but when he was in rome he sought me out very diligently and found me the lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the lord in that day in, and in how many things he ministered unto me at ephesus thou knowest very well well you wonder why is it that paul the apostle ended chapter one with this because this is just giving us like a bit of a historical scene connected with uh, the people around him in verse 15 he said timothy don't you know you know that all the people at anisha they have turned away from me what was he telling timothy he said timothy if i relied on people if i made the appreciation of people the joy of the people the interaction of the people the presence of the people the good words of the people to be my reason for holding on to sound doctrine i would abandon i would have abandoned sound doctrine for a long time if i waited for the people if i was looking to gather a crowd around me people that to say well done paul you're doing it well things are going on fine we appreciate your stand we are supporting you we're even going to die with you if i wait for such people to encourage me to stand with sound doctrine i would have fallen long ago you know timothy that all the people that were in asia minor they have turned away from me of course do you know those two people you will think that they will never have let me then he mentioned their name those people were known to timothy he said timothy can you believe it that so and so if i was depending upon them if i was not looking at jesus alone i would have backslidden in my bonds in my chains when i needed companionship most those people abandoned me but he said praise the lord everybody everybody is not like that you have only see for us just one man out of a whole lot he sought for me he looked for me may the lord show him mercy on the day of reckoning the point is this paul the apostle is saying whoever are friends whoever are foes i am with the lord whoever helps whoever tries to hinder me that doesn't matter to me i am with the lord if i had to stand alone with all in asia minor all in a whole country abandoning me to the sound doctrine i and sound doctrine will move on until i see jesus face to face and then when we get to chapter four you realize he said timothy you know now although they abandoned me although they didn't even come to me although i've been in chains and i've suffered more than any other apostle i've finished my course I've preached the word. I've kept the faith. He said, everything there is to be done. He called me to be a teacher. I fulfilled that ministry. He called me to be an apostle. I fulfilled that ministry. He called me to be an ambassador. I fulfilled that ministry. Timothy, here is the baton. I hand it over to you. You see, I have done it. I didn't lean upon any friend or any enemy. I leaned upon the Lord. Timothy, rise up, lean upon the Lord. That's what the Lord is telling you this morning. Whoever supports you, whoever does not support you, rise up and lean on the Lord. They did it in olden days. Moses did it. You can do it. Joshua did it. You can do it. John Wesley did it. There are many opposers, many people that opposed him in the message, the doctrine of holiness and sanctification. But that man, he held on to the truth till the last minute of his life. And Martin Luther, you have heard about him, the great reformer. He did it. He said, even though there are as many devils as there are tiles on the land, that is on the ground. These things you see on the ground, those are the tiles. Even though there are as many demons and devils there in that place as there are tiles there, I'm going to stand on the truth. He said, here I stand. I will not do otherwise, God being my helper. Can you say that? I said, can you say that? 
rise up and say it. And you tell the Lord, whoever supports you, whoever does not support you, you are standing on the unchanging word of the Almighty God. You are standing on sound doctrine. You are maintaining sound doctrine. You are not going to be ashamed. You are going to stay. You are going to stand with the Lord and for the Lord until your last moment here on earth. Stand by the sound doctrine of the word of God. Let nobody intimidate you. Let nobody make you afraid. Stand on the word of God that never can change. Martin Luther had to stand alone when it was necessary. You can stand. John Wesley had to stand alone when it was necessary. You can stand. You will stand. Maintain sound doctrine. Be not ashamed. Anywhere you find yourself, declare the word of God. Don't cringe. Don't tremble. Don't be afraid. Don't compromise. Don't modify the word of God. Stand on the word. Be faithful. Be faithful to the word till you see the Lord face to face. Till he rewards you on that final day. As a leader, maintain the authority of a leader. But let there be affection. Let there be appreciation of your workers and your members. Let there be affirmation of their faith, of their love, of their devotion, of their cooperation, of their service, of their ministry. Let there be affirmation. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. The Lord has not given us the spirit of fear but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. Be not ashamed, therefore, of the testimony of the Lord. And do not be ashamed of those who are declaring the truth of the word of God. Don't be ashamed of your pastor. Stand with him. Stand with him. Others may not agree with us, Stand with the people who are standing by the truth. Stay with the cardinal points of the message of salvation. Not by works, by grace. By grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Christ Jesus has brought life and immortality. Exalt him. Proclaim his name. Commit yourself to him. He's able to keep that which you commit unto him against that day. And hold on to the form of sound word. Sound doctrine. The sound teaching of the word of God. Whoever loves you, ever does not love you. Whoever cooperates with you, ever does not cooperate with you. Stay with sound doctrine. Stay with sound doctrine. It will not be long. The Lord will call us home. And is going to reward us on that day.